for the beginning times after I left him, I had a very hard time taking responsibility for the fact that I had allowed someone to treat me that way. But one of the things that I'd like to share, and, and this is one of my great secrets for having successful relationship. Jeannie, welcome to Women of Impact. Lisa, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh my God, homie, I'm so excited to have you because you are an incredible freaking entrepreneur with your plant-based cheeses, which mm. are just insane, called Shumu, and you also are married to an incredible human who mm. I know, Rich Roll. Now, when I look at you and I've heard about, again, entrepreneur, amazing partner, you guys just make each other shine. Mm. And as I started to dig into you, I had no idea actually that Rich was your third marriage. And yes. you spoke <laughs> about how much of your past marriages impacted your life and how you showed up. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I'd love to start is what are the key things that you found that being with Rich really allowed you to blossom as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and as an independent badass woman that you are? Yeah, thanks so much. Well, I mean, it's important that I highlight that I don't regard any of my marriages as failures, okay? So I think that relationships are about contracts that you have with certain individuals. And some of these contracts are forever, we could say forever, or at least in this lifetime, but some of them are just for periods of time. They could be to bring some children into the world, they could be for some other type of experience, any kind of experience to learn, to explore, to uh, you know, really create evolution together in some form. So for me, in my own experience, I've had three marriages, but I've been deeply in love six times. So uh, it, for me, my, my timeline with love was not a straight one, let's mm -hmm. say, or a certain one. Uh, so in my case, my first marriage was what I like to call a very essential step in my mastery um, but this uh, marriage was an abusive marriage and what I would describe as a hell realm that I grappled with for uh, about a seven year period. So very, very intense. Um, then I- Before you move on, I really want to go deep into this okay. if you don't mind. No, because I, I think mind. each stable, everything <clears throat> that you're talking yeah. about really has become the building blocks that mm -hmm. make you you who are, is able to sit here Definitely. today as, like I said, an amazing, incredible entrepreneur and a beautiful, having mm -hmm. a beautiful relationship. So everyone at home right now is freaking out on how mm -hmm. on earth can you sit here and say it was an abusive relationship, it was for seven years, and yet it was a successful relationship. Uh, yeah, hard to say yeah. and, and definitely hard when I was in it. So I was in my 20s when this um, man came into my life. Um, so I was um, not fully embodied in who I am, you know, didn't fully know who I was. And the big key uh, that was the catalyst that uh, put me into this experience is that I was a shadow musician, meaning that I was a singer since I was six years old but I made decisions to not sing. I did other things. Mm -hmm. And um, he was in the music business and was representing uh, very famous bands. And it was a very sort of um, heady, like um, seductive world. You know, I was backstage passes to Elton John and Tina Turner and Tears for Fears and David Bowie and Rolling Stones and Guns N' Roses and just everyone, right? So as a 20 something, it was a very, um, it, it, it seduced me, you know, and even though this was an individual that I was not, I, I was not initially attracted to, this individual pursued me relentlessly. And even though uh, after I discovered his violence and his, his trauma, really his trauma, mm -hmm. um, I left him many times, but he would not leave me alone. So he pursued me in the city, he would sit outside my work, he would call my family, if I did move out, he would be at my sister's apartment. Like it was a, mm. it was a full on thing. <laughs> like it was not, it was not like uh, I didn't want to get out of it or I hadn't, I hadn't tried to get out of it. And I also didn't realize that the abuse was there until I was already living with him. So I, I would see it in little doses, like in the form of him exploding or losing his temper or hanging up the phone. Mm. And I had the illusion that I had things under control. So I felt like I was really in the more 
aware uh, position. I could see that he was struggling, that he had a lot of immaturity. And also as a spiritually focused individual, um, I was subscribing to this idea that I should forgive him, that I should believe him when he was sorry, which he always was. It wasn't like it was happening all the time. I would have periods and months of like, you know, great uh, fun and world expansion and, you know, all this good, all these good things. And then the abuse cycle would come around. Mm -hmm. But it's like that. It's a cycle. So, um, so it was a very dangerous and very intense time. I wasn't with him for the entire seven years. I actually was with him, broke up with him, had another boyfriend for a year and a half and went back and married him. Wow, okay, so in that <laughs> moment then, yeah. if you've identified everything, yeah. because this is so common, this is the thing yeah. we do, if we can really freaking piece this apart, girl, yeah. we're, we're literally about to change people's lives, mm -hmm. because sometimes we want to hear certain things, and so even if somebody becomes maybe like the stalkerish, eventually there is that possibility that if we're insecure enough that they say the right thing that makes us feel full, that makes us want to go back. I'm so curious, what was that thing that you had told yourself in that moment of why you then went back, married him because I always think about like if we could tell our younger selves something now yeah what to do yeah what mm -hmm. to do now here's yeah. the beautiful thing I think you sitting here today mm -hmm. is the person who needed to go through all of that I don't want to say needed that's the sure. wrong word but you are who you are today because of it absolutely but I never want people to have to go through it right so what is that thing that you actually can go back and be like oh those were the things that I can identify the biggest error that I feel that I made and and, uh, and, and, you know, I don't regret anything in my life. So I didn't make an error. It was part of my mastery, which is what I told you. It was a very difficult initiation into my mastery. Uh, but the thing that I learned is that I learned that the biggest error is to put another person before you. And in my Water Tiger spiritual community, where I mentor women and people internationally, um, uh, the whole platform is uh, a living sphere of techniques that allow you to embody the truth of who you are so that you can love yourself and nurture yourself and be there for yourself as a first relationship, not a second relationship, not, not after the kids, before, number one. So I learned that that was the error because I put him before me because I could see his pain and I could see his goodness and I could see that he was suffering. And I could see that he, he didn't have the awareness that I had. And then the other part is being young and 20 and you know, the heady part of the backstage tickets mm -hmm. and you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it was a very severe teaching. And when I finally did get away, I would have these recurring dreams that he would not leave me alone. Like in the dream, I would be telling him, I don't love you, I don't love you and he would be grabbing onto my leg, like literally not letting me go. And uh, for the beginning times after I left him, I had a very hard time taking responsibility for the fact that I had allowed someone to treat me that way. Because I was, you know, I, I was hurt. I had a, a lot of hurt uh, over that. Um, and and I, I was never violent with him. Like, it was never something that I did. It was all just, you know, this abuse cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until I took responsibility as a creator being that this was part of my path. It was part of my becoming. You know, you were just saying this is who you are. But, I mean, this is part of me becoming. And so that's why I call it a vital step in my mastery that I am so grateful that I got out of that uh, had one step been to the left or the right, my life could have been over or it would have been drastically different. And the reason that I married him was literally to run the race car into the wall so that it would explode because it kept yo-yoing back. You know, like I couldn't, mm -hmm. couldn't quite get out. I couldn't get away from him. Um, so it was quite, it's quite a thing. You know, you're the first person that's ever asked me the depth of this experience. I've spoken about it before, but never really at this level. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. so important because there's something that you just said, I didn't want to interrupt, but I was like, oh God, that, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Where you said one step to the right, one step to the left, like it could have been over. Yeah. And I 
this that that haunts me girl mm -hmm. that freaking haunts me and that's why i do this show that's why i need to go deep on things because someone listening right now that one little step to the right mm -hmm. changes their life mm -hmm. but if they can hear the nuance in your stories and the beauty in it then it gives them hope and it allows them to know then to assess what direction to go into mm -hmm. before it's like i don't want to say too late because i don't want to mm -hmm. be like that extreme but it's going to be harder to unwind. It's going to be harder to go backwards. And so when I think through everything that you just said, how the hell then did you not become a victim? Well, I think it's by understanding that we are all universal creators and that we, at some level, plan the life. So we come in and we have these agreements. Like, I'm going to create a life that is a field that has certain aspects in it. And as I go through that, that is going to catalyze these constrictions, I'll call them, and expansions, and different sort of flavors, mm -hmm. we could say, that create a certain quality of life experience that will give me the fuel or the alchemy or the friction to create evolution, to have really excelled, really expanded, and to have learned that lesson. Mm -hmm. So it clearly was, in my case, uh, that step in my mastery because I didn't waste the lesson. Now, it took me way longer than, you know, I would recommend. It was a seven-year cycle in total. But um, the other thing that I, I really want to highlight, and I think this is the key, the key is that it is not spiritual to put another being before you. It is not. And what we, what we get called is, you know, the word narcissism gets thrown around quite a lot in our society. Um, I'm talking about understanding that you are a divine life form that has been brought into this realm. The sun is shining on everything in creation without cessation, without edit. And every being is no more loved or less loved in the eyes of creation. It's not a contest. And in order to be spiritual, this program of martyrdom, which is very present in the feminine embodiment in this in this planet is not it mm. that's not it that is not um really uh, honoring the divine force within you can you explain what you mean by that exactly like how does that translate into actions that we how we show up to what be? it means is really uh going into meditation going into a, a spiritual practice to commune with yourself in the silence to you know, journal to, it's, it's not the same as running, it's not the same as these type of things, but those can be good beginning sort of steps. But to enter into a yoga practice, a breathwork practice, a meditation, in Water Tiger, we do a lot of open eye meditation in the mirror, mm. which is one of the most transformative techniques. It's very confronting, um, but to actually look at yourself in the mirror, preferably naked, uh, but also, you know, gazing at the third eye and keeping that focus, even though your eyes will want to close, grabbing that focus again, and many things will come up. Oh, God, okay, that's amazing. But did you do that before you went into your next marriage? Or that was something recent? Because I'd love to actually take through your evolution because mm -hmm. your story is so damn powerful. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm just going to keep coming back mm -hmm. to there are these moments in life mm -hmm. that steer us in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. And depending on what direction we go to, it can actually dictate where we end up in life and sure. whether we've achieved our dreams, whether we are the person that we can, we can say we're proud of. Mm -hmm. And so when you were out of that relationship, had you understood that it has to be about self first or did you enter a new relationship? Because I think I heard you say it was the next one was your fairy tale relationship. So fairy tale, and you said this yes. in front of Rich, your That's husband true. now. So I actually would love to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say that I was born with the spiritual gene. I'm one of those beings. Yeah. Like, so I had the same feeling that I have today when I was a baby. It's, it's the, I don't feel different. However, I hadn't had the life experience. So I went through this whole drug exploration in my teens, but really as a result, because I was living in a family that was not spiritually focused and I was very spiritually focused and I couldn't get out of that life. And so this is the beauty about these moments of constriction because when everything's going great, it's not usually when we make big changes or when we really dive in. So, you know, I call them and have called them with Rich and everything that we've done is they're a sacred moment mm -hmm. is what they are. Like I didn't go through an abusive marriage. It was a sacred moment because it's the kind that brings you to your knees and there's no, nowhere else to go.
So if anybody's listening to this interview and, and watching and they're in that moment, you know, I invite a shift of perspective because again, life is made up of perspectives. It doesn't matter what happens to you. It matters your perspective about mm -hmm. what happens to you. So um, I ended up meeting uh, my second husband, uh, who's the father of my two beautiful sons, my oldest children, uh, Tyler and Trapper. And I met him on Valentine's Day in a job interview. And this job interview was catalyzed by the sister of the current husband who imposed upon me to meet with this gentleman. And I didn't want to go and I was annoyed. And I went and when we looked at each other, it was a past life recognition. By the time breakfast was over, we were already in love. Mm -hmm. And you know, he was scrambling and asking questions and I was still married to this other person. And I wasn't telling him because I was trying to get the job. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he, he was a manager of a big real estate company. Um, so I didn't, I didn't lead on, like I didn't let him know, but the events ensued and within probably a month to six weeks, uh, I was leaving the abuser finally. And, uh, and he was like, uh, you know, I got to see you, like, where are you? So that was a very fast, um, connect. And we were married, uh, you know, just within like nine months, like my divorce was final. We were married the next month and I was with him for 10 years wow. of the most, one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. But he, he literally just loved me into my creative being. Those 10 years were a process of me being, never having to say, I'm sorry. He had to teach me not to say I was sorry. And all he did was adore me and love me and support me. It was, it was overwhelming and amazing and, and uh, a huge gift of my life, huge gift of my life. Wow. And how much of that, where someone supports you and accepts you for who you are, mm -hmm. makes a difference for you to feel the freedom to keep exploring? Oh, huge. I mean, huge, huge. Um, and you know, I had been experiencing the very severe opposite of that, mm -hmm. you know, so I had to get comfortable with it, to tell you the truth. Sometimes it was too much. It was too much presence, mm -hmm. you know, too much, like a little too nice. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. How do you process those moments? Because right. it's like sometimes you can, when someone's being very genuine, you can be so um, skeptical of it sure. based on your past experiences. Yeah. And now it's like you say that you want someone who loves you, respects you, but here you are actually dismissing it when it happens. Sure. It's a, it's, it was a comfort level, you know, something mm. that I wasn't used to. How did really. you navigate that? And did you become more comfortable over time? Like, yeah, how did you become much. not protective of letting yourself go in another relationship? Well, uh, because I just had this other energy that was so safe, mm. so safe and so nourishing and so charming and kind and just fun, you know, just a completely different sort of reflection. Mm. But one of the things that I'd like to share, and, and this is one of my great secrets for having successful relationship, and I think I heard you speaking about it recently, um, is really taught, really communicating. And communicating uh, when something feels off, the way to diffuse it is to call it out, whatever that is, whether it's an attraction, whether it's um, an uncomfortable feeling, whether it's uh, jealousy, whether it's uh, anything, really anything, and the freedom to be able to bring words or bring a, a definition to what that energy is, it brings it out and allows you as a couple mm -hmm. to talk through it, to communicate through it so that it can go away. If you don't talk about it and you shove it down and you're trying to act like everything's fine or be strong or, you know, or, or shove it down, um, it can grow. It can mm. still exist. It's almost like you want to call out whatever that dark thing is in the corner of the room so that you can bring it out in the light and you can really look at it and really see what it is. Oh God, I love that so much. Yes, I'm so with you there. Um, but it's in the fear of putting, shining a light on something that makes people not shine in the light in the first place. Mm -hmm. And what I found beautiful is one of your interviews that you do with Rich mm -hmm. and he asks you like the very first question, 
literally you start the interview and he says so honey how are you feeling about the state of our marriage i know and i was like that immediately is like they have a beautiful marriage now look i'm not behind the scenes so i don't actually yeah, know yeah. but when you go to we communication do. that's the thing where you can be mm -hmm. so open and vulnerable mm -hmm. to ask your partner how do you feel because you're leaving space for them to say i'm not happy this is wrong and yet there's so much beauty in making sure that you give your partner the space to be honest and say things like that so how did you and rich get to the point where you can have that type of communication 20 years down the line be so secure mm. um and then i want to talk about how you guys have evolved together because i think that that's yeah. huge well again you know you look at the trajectory of my of my romantic experiences so i had this abusive experience i had this fairy tale experience and then I have my beautiful marriage now with Rich, which is really one of union. You know, it's a partnership mm -hmm. of opposites, um, but it's uh, on a very sort of equal ground, you know, and it is held in a field of unconditional love and trust that surpasses anything that I've experienced with anyone else. So the level of intimacy that we can go to is deeper than anything else that I've ever experienced. And that is probably largely due to his 12-step program. I want to just give a shout out to the 12-step program and to men in recovery or people in recovery, mm -hmm. because it gives a language to communicate. It gives a language of accountability. Um, a language of being able to look at yourself. And so from the two of us, we have me, who I'm sp spiritually oriented, so I'm looking at it from that devotional aspect and also always taking accountability and looking within. So if you have an issue, the answer is inside mm -hmm. of, you, of, of your own self. That's where the treasure is. So between these two modalities, we've been able to, you know, really, really, uh, be safe with each other and be able to say, you know, I really don't like what you did, you know, or I don't like what you're doing, or I don't like the behavior. Uh, but the love is always there. It's like, I love you, but I might not like the behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's different. It's not the same thing. You know, we're not our actions. We're not our emotions. We're not our thoughts and our words necessarily. One of the biggest fallacies is that relationships shouldn't be work. Say what? what? We put time, effort and hard work into growing our careers or our business, but love should just happen? After 20 years of being married, all stars were being willing to ask and answer hard questions. I have a free downloadable PDF for you for a happy, successful, lasting love. Click the link below for free access to the most important questions you must ask your partner, PDF. Um, you know, so if we can keep that soul connection and allow it to be a little bit, a little messy, but always respectful. So never any, you know, we, we're very good about never saying unkind things that you can't take back. There is a certain decorum in that process. Mm. You know, no one storms out no one disappears for days at a time you know it's like there is um respect and uh an agreement within that so we do have some agreements um but we're you know we come from two different universes as you are well, well and, and that's what i find so amazing is when people come from tif me and tom as well like we are completely night and day um and when we first met everyone was like well how how are you guys going to make it work like you're really you know you're greek orthodox he doesn't have any religion mm -hmm. you know um you come from different cultures different backgrounds different lifestyles like there's so much that's different but in when i think back there was a foundation of values that we shared. Mm -hmm. And so even though we showed up as two very different humans and acted in different ways, our core values were exactly the same. I think that's true. I think that's, that's a very um, key part that Rich and I share, like mm. the way we parent our children, mm. um, the way that we will solve a conflict. Um, it's very much the same. So maybe the things that really, really matter are the things that we're more in alignment mm. with 
than, you know, day to day, like this is how I get my joy or this is what I'm interested in life right. or you like know, we'll always agree to respect each other. Yes. Okay. Now what does that actually look like? What does that mean? Like kind of dig in deeper because I don't know about you. Because I come from a very traditional Greek Orthodox family, then if you've ever been in a, a household of Greeks, we're very loud and we're very boisterous. We ask a question, we turn our heads, we don't listen to answers, we speak over each other, and that's just the culture. Mm -hmm. Tom comes into the, uh, the, um, the dynamic and we leave, and I'm like, my family is the most giving, loving family I've ever met. And we leave, and Tom's like, they were so rude. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he was like, babe, they were talking over me. Your dad asked me a question, he doesn't even listen. And I was like, oh, we have a different perception of what respect looks like. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that we are okay with disrespecting people. It's just that our levels just don't match. And so instead of saying, well, we're different, let's just actually get aligned of what respect looks like so we can speak mm -hmm. the same language. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's powerful. It's very, very powerful. And we're not the same. None of us are the same. And so, you know, the opposites can create a lot of alchemy mm -hmm. and a lot of transformation. And I mean, you guys are living proof of that. So it's like, yeah, there's something in that recipe that creates the friction, mm. you know, that, that polishes the diamond. Because, you know, maybe it wouldn't be as dynamic if it was just uh, two of the same, you know, right, I, don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, so let's talk, actually talk about that friction because mm -hmm. sometimes, like you said, the friction can be great. It's exactly what you need to get aligned, be great couple, really work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that friction where you think, oh my God, I just need to work through the friction, but actually it just becomes worse. And now that friction becomes the break or the crack in your relationship. And now there's, um, you're trying to repair it, but actually it probably would have been better to let go sooner. Mm -hmm. How do you... I've, in fact, I've heard you speak with Rich about one of the scenarios where I believe he had a relapse. And that was one of the moments in your relationship where it almost broke you guys. In that moment with the friction, how did you know, or what were the signs, maybe you didn't know, but maybe you can share with us some thoughts about how you decided to keep going and try and fix, not fix that, it's not the right word, become in harmony again versus say, okay, this friction now, doesn't serve our marriage, it, maybe it's time to break up. Yeah, I mean, it's a big one. In my case, in this one instance, um, I had a, the universe gave me the, uh, the set the table, let's just say that. So I came back from Rich um, DNFing and using, and it was finally my time to record my record because I recorded two albums with my sons were in my band. Mm. And so it was finally my time and I had waited all this time. We didn't have enough money and I'd been supporting Rich and his training and I, I, it was my time. So I had the recording engineer coming to my house and we had set up and we had started recording my record. And I was just like, I can't, I can't deal with this right now. Like I'm not dealing with this mm -hmm. right now. So there was a little time out. And then right after that, during the recording, um, my son's beloved father died uh, tragically. And then it was just irrelevant. Like the DNF was completely mm. irrelevant at that point. And we just moved on. And, but I would say, you know, barring that kind of drastic universal moment, um, I would say, you know, you just gotta let shit go. I mean, basically, it, you can decide to hold a grudge and live in the past and grind and grind and grind and grind and it's only going to create suffering and so i always ask myself am i going to be married to this man yes uh you know uh, do i have a million other things that we've experienced that have been you know loving and expansive and creative and life affirming yes and it's a choice you know do i want to live in that hell and hold on to that or do I want to be free and just let it go? So it's like being born anew, like in the moment, in a new moment, in a new moment. Um, and, you know, what you put your attention on is what you create. So, you know, where you put your focus is what you're going to create more energy on. And you found this in a relationship. Like if you guys get stuck on one thing and you just keep going in and you're like, poking the bleeding wound and picking the scab off, like that's what you were talking about. But if you just shift the focus, 
it can be a whole, whole new reality, like in a matter of an hour almost. So I think it just comes with maturity and just, you know, sometimes you're going to be disappointed. That's how it goes. And in every decision you make, there will be positive things about it and negative things about it. Nothing is all good or all bad. Life is gray. It's not black or white. So again, coming back to what I was suggesting, it's how you apply perspective. Mm. And so again, in my spiritual mentorship, it's all about taking the empowerment of applying the perspective that you choose. Mm. So when I went through a nine year financial collapse with Rich during our marriage, which catalyzed everything that we've become, people would say to me, you know, oh, you know, you're, you know, you're a deadbeat, you can't pay your bills, you know, I didn't have a bank account for four years, you know, I had both cars repossessed, I couldn't get my kids to school. Things were intense. Um, and uh, a lot of people wanted to apply their fear onto me. This was a big one, because I was going through this sort of alchemization of the money system. So on a planetary level, I knew that I was clearing some of the violence in, in our systems um, against people, artists, like how many beautiful musicians or artists or teachers or philosophers, you know, are selling insurance mm. because they're trying to pay their bills because, you know, we're in this paradigm, right? Yeah. So I knew by going through this that I was starting to melt some edges of that for the collective, right? And so Rich, which made no sense, I was telling him to train first, to see to me and the kids second, and if a law job fell in his lap, he could service it, but without any emotion, mm. because he, that was not in alignment for him. And why did I do this? I knew this because I could feel the energy. It was a shift in the energy. You know, he could have sent out thousands of resumes and he wouldn't have gotten a job. We were in this alchemy experience and this was part of our becoming so that we could be the catalysts and the examples, the living examples for others to choose a life of living according to their heart, their dreams. And so, um, again, it's perspective, people would become very afraid and they would be freaking out. Like, because if this is happening to you, then it could happen mm -hmm. to me. So I want you to get away from me. Or I would have somebody say, you know, if I was you, I wouldn't choose bankruptcy. I just wouldn't choose it. And I looked at this individual and I said, really? I said, well, it might just choose you someday. That's a you great know. answer. <laughs> well, it's, it, w it was not a light thing. And, and also yes. in our story, it wasn't like I woke up one day and I was like, we're going to choose our hearts and lose all our money and, Why? you know, starve for nine years. Like, it, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. It's a feeling. You can feel it. And I call it being dismantled. It's like the energy no longer matches the vibration that you hold. Mm -hmm. And so there was nothing to attach to us. And so there were years of self-discovery of Rich becoming a vegan plant-based ultraman, of running in the mountains, of me meditating and you know, doing uh, so many ceremonies and rituals and all kinds of things that I've done that I haven't written about mm -hmm. um, and, and creating music with my children over a seven year period that was worth me taking a body for just to make music with my boys for seven years. Are you kidding me? Like no one even had to hear a note. It was already fulfilled on the deepest level. So people would say to me, you know, you're, you know, they would project that fear of, you know, you're, you're a loser, you're a deadbeat, you can't pay, pay your bills, you're... And I would say, no, I'm in my sacred moment. And at the time, they thought she's an insane person. <laughs> but now, mm. but now... What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confident workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. People call me all the time or come up to me and they're, 
they're emotional about it because they know what we did mm. to be standing in this place where we are. And once you live it and you digest it, it's your experience. No one can take it from you. Someone can't say online, you know, oh, screw them, they're fraud. Like, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Because it's in the being. And truth and beingness, they don't defend, they simply are. And it's, 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 it's part of who I am. It's part of my makeup. Ooh, okay, there's so much there that I didn't want to interrupt you, but girl, we've got to go deep. Okay, there was one thing that you said, first of all, that I was like, that just takes such security in oneself to turn to your partner and say, put me second. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd love to actually talk about that because many people, if they're not put first in their relationship, they feel less than and then they feel insecure in that relationship. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, I'd love to pull apart that piece where you said to him, like, you know, was it his, um, his running first? Was that mm -hmm. training? His training first mm -hmm. and then you and the kids. Mm -hmm. um, break that down for me because it is so beautiful mm -hmm. because that's also the gift that I think we want is that let me be me first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, being uh, somebody that believes or, or feels deeply that we come into this life to become who we are. Mm -hmm. And there's only one of you in the entire omniverse. So there's not another Lisa coming. Um, so if I wanted that for myself, I had to want that for Rich. I had to want it for him. It's, it would be hypocritical and misaligned if I only wanted it for me. And so while it seemed on the surface, what I should have been telling him is go get another law job. I just knew that the way to evolution and expansion is through the heart. The heart doesn't fail you. It will not fail you ever. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. So I always say like, I didn't know it was going to take that long. It was tough. Mm -hmm. It was really tough. And let me be clear. I want to be seen as much as rich. I'm not behind rich. And it's been a little challenging in, in my life because I felt I was going to be fully realized when I was 30. I just turned 60. And I haven't even begun. I'm, I'm just beginning. And so a lot of the narrative in the culture about, you know, rich being, you know, rich, 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 which is beautiful and it's amazing. That's a challenge in our marriage now. It, because I was never behind Rich. I was the entrepreneur. I was pushing him the whole time. And of his own admission, he, you know, he said to me the other day, he said, you are always destined for a great life. And he said, and you, you knew I was destined for a great life, but I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, and Rich is just, he's masterful at what he does. I mean, what a beautiful, expression of life and everything that he's created and his platform has given so many people like so much love and nourishment and and uh celebration you know and being his partner it's like i don't go you know he's at he's at a, a google event right now and i'm not going because i'm not available to be arm candy i don't do that so okay this is so amazing but let's let's go deep on this because everything you're saying is things that i deal with i know so many other people deal with and battle especially now as we're we women are now finding it beautiful to be able to step into our own to build our own businesses to be independent to have our own voice to have our own platforms um and so the nuance of stepping into your own, but also supporting someone that is just as strong, just as vocal, has just as strong of a voice, but not ma making sure that you don't disappear into the background, making sure that you don't step in, you're, you don't um, stay in the shadows. And it reminded me of one moment, it was probably a couple of years ago now, before I was actually in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. One day Tom and I were talking and he broke down in tears. Mm -hmm. And he said, babe, no one will truly understand that I'm the man I am today because of you. Mm. And everyone gives me the accolades because he's in front of the camera mm. and because people know his name. Mm. And he's like, I, I wouldn't exist or be the person I am if it wasn't for you. And you don't get any of that recognition, if you will. And so there was something you said earlier that I really want to make sure that we pinpoint as we start to talk about this is you said it was your turn. So you were stepping into the studio. Mm -hmm. How many of us women wait for it to be our turn, yeah. mm -hmm. how we're like, okay, let me just have the kids. Let me just make sure mm -hmm. the husband is good. Let me make sure that I've supported him first mm -hmm. and then it will be my turn. 
Yeah, I mean, that's just a gigantic whole universal, like it's a planetary condition that, that you're speaking to. And it's because we live in a patriarchal, a patriarchal realm, you would say. So it's the masculine that has been celebrated that is put in the forefront. And it starts thousands of years ago and even beyond that, when the feminine frequency was ripped out of the spiritual history of this planet. All right. So it's not just me too. It's way before then. Mm -hmm. It's where no priests were, were uh, women anymore, where we were burned at the stake for healing with plants. Uh, we've been eradicated out of the entire, uh, uh, our entire divine place, our divine right place in life. So this doesn't have mm -hmm. to do with our husbands or our partners. Mm -hmm. This is a program that is very, very deep. So it's important that we start to recognize that this is what this moment in time is about. This is a new procession, planetary procession, and a new moment, a new eon, a new age. And so this is about the feminine coming into her rightful position, mm -hmm. not overpowering the masculine, right. but in equal balance, right? So masculine and feminine exist within each of us, and let's be clear that the feminine energy wants to be seen. So relationship tip, if you're in relationship with a woman or a feminine embodied person, they want to be seen. Make sure you are seeing them. Mm -hmm. See them, see them, see them. That is what the feminine wants. So then you get to you know, you were saying, how do you not be in the background? How do we do it? Because we're nurturing, and not only are we nurturing our children, we're nurturing our partners as well. Mm. So there is a time element. I mean, it, 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 I, I wasn't putting myself in the background because I was doing all of my spiritual practices and my rituals and my ceremonies, and I was holding the vision and I was leading the way. I was, I was guiding him through this awakening. And I was also working on my music. So not only was I writing music and, and lyrics and music, but that I then was collaborating with my sons who were becoming musicians. Mm. So there is give and take. I mean, there is yeah. times where you give to your partner and you, and you serve, but I guess where we're not is in the martyrdom. There is no place for martyrdom, mm. for like to not fulfill yourself because someone else you know, is in the front position or whatever. So it's a challenge. And I think it's probably the biggest challenge in Rich in my relationship right now, because we're not, you know, I'm not in, we're not collaborating on, on as many things. And we're both makers. Mm -hmm. We both are creating things. And so, you know, that's a, that's a little bit of a challenge. Like how do we intersect? Yeah, that's, that is what is so incredible. I mean, one of, um, um, a million things of what's so incredible about your journey and your story is um, having gone through everything you've just laid out for us and then really owning that you are an equal and that this is what I'm doing, this is what I love, now's my time, I'm going to do it, you know, I'm still going to serve my husband and having like this beautiful, I don't even say balance, it's, I like the word harmony, I prefer mm -hmm. harmony, right? Like You've that. got a better harmony with how you show up every day. And the thing that I just, I get asked a lot from my audience is the evolution piece, is that, mm -hmm. hey, for the first couple of years, I was so supportive, you know, that's my story. For eight years, I was supporting my husband. I was a stay-at-home wife, I was cooking for him, I was cleaning for him but I wasn't in my own I wasn't saying what I wanted and that was on me not on him mm -hmm. but I was profoundly unhappy I didn't enjoy providing for him food and that wasn't my love language or it wasn't his. it was his but it wasn't mine so I wasn't finding any satisfaction and instead I was just becoming more and more unhappy and miserable and it was hard for me to get out of that to speak up and say hey I'm not living the life I actually want and so in what you're saying there's this evolution piece of I used to be this or I used to show up like this and now I'm transitioning. And when you're in a relationship with somebody else that is prides themselves also on evolving, like Rich and like my husband Tom, it becomes difficult to navigate to your point of how this is who I want to be, this is what I want to become, this is who um, how I want to evolve. And so you focus on that and at the same time your partner's doing that making sure you're always aligned and not going off on different paths is very difficult. And this is where whenever I backtrack and I go, where was the point where people started to split apart? Mm -hmm. Because when you hear about marriage, when you hear about relationships, they were once connected, you hope, right? They were once 
totally on the same line. And then people say, I blinked and now they've changed or I've blinked and now we're not connecting. And the truth is you never freaking just blink ever. Mm -hmm. So what happens in that blinking moment that we're not paying attention to Mm -hmm. that then takes our drive and our want to be an independent woman, a badass, an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. these are the words I like to use, where you've created this streamer, which is amazing, (laughs) which we're definitely gonna go into, Mm -hmm. but you've poured your heart and soul into this Mm -hmm. product and it's succeeding and it's freaking blowing up. Mm -hmm. And now people are knowing who you are more and more. And Rich is on his path. Mm -hmm. So I know you said this is actually a difficult moment. What are you guys doing if you don't mind sharing some of those things? Because I never want someone to go, I have to choose between my independence, my career, my life, and my relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't think that has to be a choice of one or the other, if you're in the right relationship. Right. Well, I would say it's important to acknowledge that we are in a planetary procession, a moment of transformation, and everyone, Mm -hmm. no matter where you are, you're going through change and evolution. So... No one is going to stay in a status quo. Everything is gonna evolve. So there's a couple things that I'm focused on and I've been communicating with Rich about. And one of the big questions is, how do you wanna evolve? Not, not from a focus of how do, we, um, how do we guard the relationship, okay? So I'm being more, mm. I'm being more um, uh, courageous than that. Ooh, go on. So again, so, so similarly, as I supported him through that moment of transformation, and when Rich and I were married, probably similarly to you guys, you know, we vowed to support each other to realize our wildest dreams. That was our vow. So, you know, I had studied with a, an Indian master, one of my many, one of my many boyfriend guru, gurus, <laughs> uh, who uh, proposed to me that human love is like a business arrangement. Human love says that if you do X, Y, and Z, then I will love you. Mm. And if you cease to do X, Y, and Z, I will remove my love from you. And he was comparing that to divine love. And he was saying divine love is like the sun. It's simply shining without cessation, without edit, without terms, without rules, without a deal, right? And that was one of the big catalysts in Rich and my relationship when he was eating a lot of meat and a lot of junk food and he was struggling. It was this shift that allowed him to become who he is, Mm -hmm. was releasing this. So our big questions to ourselves right now are what are you hiding? Oh, that's such a hard question. Explain that question actually first. Well, we're all hiding something, right? I mean, because... Uh, because we have a society and we have this patriarchal system and we have systems and schools and jobs and you know whatever you thought you were supposed to be or whatever you thought thought the world was going to be um, or um, aspects of yourself that you haven't sat with or uh, levels of yourself that you haven't embodied you know I always say like if you're judging another person if you see somebody online and they're annoying you and you have all this stuff to say about them It's because you haven't loved yourself enough Mm. because it's not a contest. (laughs) So if you have to tear another person down or it's it's really annoying you, what you're really annoyed at is that you haven't given yourself that level of presence and really taken the time to know who you are, what you love. So as we evolve and as we go through different layers of awareness, what are you hiding? Like, what is it inside of yourself that you have not even allowed yourself to see? Mm -hmm. The second question is, how do you want to evolve? How do you want to evolve? I mean, we've been now in these relationships, these marriages for going on 20 years, over 20 years. And we're going to be here maybe for a while. No one ever knows. But, you know, you, you guys are like fit and healthy and you have all this stuff going on. So it's like, How do we want to evolve? You know, you've already digested this level of relationship. And so where is that going? Because probably like Rich and I have one sort of agreement. We promised each other we would never go to Home Depot with each other on the weekends. (laughs) 
Like did something super profound and like mind blowing right now. And it's like, don't go to Home Depot. That is off limits for us. <laughs> that is never happening. So, uh, you know, so the, it's this wonderful uh, moment, this precipice, this vista that we're standing on of creating ourselves anew. And in order to do that, we have to be courageous. We have to love each other so much that we have to want the ultimate for ourselves mm. and the ultimate for our partner. And there are certain things that I will never do with Rich. And there are certain things that he will never do with me. And I'm not talking about, you know, don't start thinking like I'm saying open relationship because it's not what I'm saying. And as a matter of fact, I, I want to talk about sacred sexuality within this context because we're also at a platform in our sexual relations mm. that we are being called to rewrite a sacred union that is an experience of activating the divinity that is in within us, meaning creativity, spirituality, and sexuality is a trinity. It's the same force. So what if you knew, what if we knew that our sexual energy was our most sacred force? How would you enter into that? And how would that exchange be different? So I don't think it's existing yet. Some of us are starting to rewrite that experience. Oh my God, thinking about sexuality, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I was just like, I was like, this is amazing. Thinking about sexuality on the same path as creativity is fascinating. Fascinating. I've never thought about it like that. But when I think about my creativity, it is a thing that I must do at every week. I must be creative. Otherwise, I feel like I'm trapped. Mm -hmm. And so then thinking about sexuality piece, I want to tap into things that empower me, period. Mm -hmm. And if that happens to be sexuality, I'm going to freaking explore it. Mm -hmm. It is an important, like I think of things of all the superpowers us as women have mm -hmm. that we don't tap into. Yeah. And when I think about sexuality, when I think about it's bringing confidence within ourselves, it's us knowing our body. Because how often do we ignore the signs that our bodies are trying to tell us that something's wrong? We just ignore it. Why? Because we haven't allowed ourselves time and space to tap into the signals. And when you talk about sexuality, if I could be just so blatant right now, I was like 15 the first time I took a mirror and actually looked at myself. Mm -hmm. Now, at 15, to not know my body well enough, to not understand myself, to not really tap into myself, I think is a missed opportunity for me to really own um, who I want to be, how I show up, how I feel, tap into my emotions, tap into my creativity and everything that you've just said. No, absolutely. And I mean, th this is, we are literally sons of God and goddess embodied in these bodies. So this body is sacred technology that is the housing for your spirit and soul. So that again is a click of changing the focus, how you eat, how you talk to yourself, mm -hmm. what energy are you consuming? You know, everything is, is energy, whether it's a show you're watching or friends that you keep around you or, so that, that's a, a big global part of what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. We're embodying these bodies and these, these mechanisms are miraculous. It's about coming into communion with yourself at, as you were speaking at these levels and understanding that, you know, at the moment of climax that you can direct this energy with intention. Mm -hmm. You can create an altar space, right? Um, so you can prepare a sacred ritual space before you enter in. And uh, it can be done either solo or with a conscious partner. But, you know, lots of things like, you know, offering flowers, anointing with oil, setting a sacred intention, eye gazing, being present with mm -hmm. each other um, and, you know, really understanding what you're dealing with. And it, it, there's a lot like it's a whole field of changing because on this planet we have not been interacting with it in a divine way at all. God, that's so beautiful. How much of that, and I didn't get to finish uh, really asking you about it earlier, where you were saying that you have people look in the mirror mm -hmm. to see themselves. So as we start to talk about how we get to know ourselves more, I definitely want to make sure that we um, we tie that into yeah. your um, badass company and being an independent woman, because like as we mm -hmm. go through this, identifying self, mm 
mm-hmm. through sexuality is so amazing and beautiful. And so if you don't mind actually explaining the tactic that you use, which you said earlier, where you look in the mirror. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'd love to actually This is about- really like for anybody watching, if you're, you know, you will, you will find such immense transformation in this technique. So you just go into a mirror where you can sit in private and, you know, the light could be low, you know, and you could have a candle sort of nearby or, you know, just have low light and just find a way to relax and, and fix your gaze, you know, be comfortable and start to connect to your breath. So you're going to start to take long, deep fluid inhale, just drawing it up. And then you're going to pause at the top and then you're going to take another exhale and you're just going to let that go and then you're going to pause at the bottom and then you're going to fix your gaze in the mirror in your third eye point and you're going to endeavor to keep your eyes open you can do it with me here we can do a little thing so look at my third eye point and then just try to keep your eyes open without freaking out about it without stressing and then your eyes will want you you'll end up blinking them and then just return Mm. but see if you can stay still in your head and don't move your head and just uh, gaze at that point and breathe connect to your breath and you'll start to see some changes happening in my face probably Mm. and you'll start to maybe feel some sensations so if you're doing this with yourself it's quite different than if you're gazing in another So when you do this with yourself, we can do this with partners Mm -hmm. and yoga and stuff. We would do it for a longer time. And, but if you do this with yourself as a dedicated practice, maybe start with five, 10 minutes a day and just do it, do it for 21 days, just five or 10 minutes. That's all. And what, how does that help then? What is that exactly doing to you? It will start to reveal the presence that is holding your life Mm. so you start to kind of go in and feel it feeling yourself and acknowledging your body and connecting it's like a sort of maybe emerging with a witness presence Mm. so sometimes in tantra we call it second attention where i can be talking to you during this interview but my attention is on a greater aspect of who i am so i'm here but there is a much greater energy that is activated, Mm. I guess you would say. So without giving people, you know, I don't want to interfere with someone's experience, but if you're curious, you should try it because it will clear a lot of either emotion or resistance. Mm. You know, we, we speak so horribly to our beautiful vessels. We're always telling our bodies that they're not quite the right one, that we wish they had blue eyes or brown eyes, or that we were curvier or skinnier or younger or whatever it is. And if you and I went to lunch and if we spoke to each other the way that maybe we used to speak to our bodies, we probably wouldn't see each other again. But we talk to our own body like that every day. So it's really getting in tune with the fact that you are a sacred technology. Mm -hmm. And how do you want to speak to your body? How do you want to commune with your body? Mm -hmm. And how about just beginning by saying thank you? Like, thank you, I love you. Thank you for everything. And see, it's very, it's very counter because, you know, in spiritual practices or religions, we've been told that we're sinners, that we're not divine, that it's blasphemous to think that you're an aspect of God. But we are nature. We are nature. We don't have to go out into nature. We are nature. Mm. And nature is divine. And we are part of this ecosystem. We are a microcosm of the macrocosm. So it's this click. This is the main click that changes every other experience in life. So this connection to spirituality is the first point. It's not the 25th point. It's not the thing you do the 100th point. It's the first point. And if you have the first point connected and you always go there, then everything else trickles from there. Then the relationship with yourself, Mm -hmm. then the relationship with your loved ones, then whatever you're doing. And this is really the basis for Srimu. Srimu is like a little play on divine cow, right? And um, uh, it's an option. So it's universal. It's keto, paleo, gluten-free, dairy-free, plant-rich, and it rivals any dairy cheese. So it can be right on the board with your dairy cheese. Like, I'm not asking you to give up your love of cheese. I just made it better for your body, for the animals, 
for the planet, which ultimately means for our children. And you know, we can all agree that there is a lot of planetary, planetary destruction in the animal agriculture. And everyone has their own journey. Um, my journey is one of open arms. I have a seat at my table for every human, anyone. And, um, and you know, life is, uh, life is beautiful and you, you never know who somebody is and we just need more love in the world. Uh, we don't need more violence or more judgment. Uh, we just need more love. And you bring it in spades and with this company. So first of all, I want everyone to know, at home, I literally have to hide this box because my <laughs> husband will steal it from me. He's obsessed with the stuff. Now, Sweet. health is very important to us. Okay. I, my audience know I have a lot of gut issues, a lot of health issues. Yeah. And so I had to stop eating dairy. I had to stop eating a lot of things. And so this is an amazing, um, not even substitute, because substitute makes it seem like it's secondary. Mm -hmm. It is so good. I forget it's not actual cheese I like so amazing the quality and the look and the aesthetic is so stunning mm -hmm. and so having met you and hearing your story and then connecting it with this product and the fact like I was making connecting all the dots right like it was I heard about the cheese before I actually realized that you were Rich Roll's wife. Mm -hmm. And so I was in such admiration of the product. Mm -hmm. Then I found out that you were Rich Roll's wife. Then I went into your relationship and realized that you guys have the same dynamic as me and Tom. Um, so I would love to actually talk about as you start to build this, mm -hmm. what did that look like? How did you start to own that this is you really freaking mm -hmm. stepping in like, the into the world like everyone know now knows that you're the creator of this yeah. how do you do that how do you navigate it within your relationship and then um i want to just keep talking about the product itself because Yay. it is like who is actually changing and how mm. it's changing people's lives mm, thank you for that it's so beautiful you know i think the the reason that it's so powerful though is because like me and you it's it was an organic process mm. so it wasn't like i was like oh this plant-based you know in, in sector is really blowing up let me go start a business you know that's not mm -hmm. it was very natural so we were going through our transformation i was making music rich was training and you know i maybe you don't know i healed myself of a cyst in my neck um, in 2007 that was um, incurable and uh, the doctors you know were uh, recommending surgery or insisting surgery wow. and I just was not going to let them cut my neck. Um, it was not an easy surgery. It was like a medium level surgery. And it wasn't cancerous, but it was a gigantic golf ball sized cyst in the front of my neck. Um, I was uh, deeply into yoga and started to get into Ayurveda. So I worked with an Ayurvedic physician and I took herbs and ate predominantly a plant based diet for about 18 months and I healed myself completely of this cyst. So that was really the first journey with food in our family that hasn't really been uh, highlighted much. Um, and then, uh, you know, Rich was struggling with his diet and just, you know, drinking venti um, Starbucks with three ad shots and like in and out burgers and trays of donuts and, you know, just crazy eating. And um, we had this catalyst moment where I was trying to get him to eat healthier, trying to provide better choices. And the more that I reached out, the more paralyzed he became. Mm. So that was when entered this Indian master who talked to me about human love versus divine love. And it was at that moment that I released Rich to his own journey, meaning I stopped needing him to self-realize with me, eat the way I ate, even be on the same trajectory that I was on. And I called him and was like, I'm sorry that I've been in your space. I get it now and I release you to your life. Wow. And he was like, uh, where's the ambush gonna you know, come <laughs> out of the bushes and, you know, and right. jump on me? Yeah, is this like a trick? It was, or... Yeah, it was so like out of character. But it was in fact that act that catalyzed everything that we've become today. Mm. And he will describe it to you that he felt that I was no longer in his space. Wow. And so for all that time he'd been pushing, you know, well, she, you know, she, 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 and she's trying to get me to do this. Mm -hmm. And then I was just gone. It just wasn't there. So he, and I was there in love though. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like in a retaliation. It was truly, truly there. So um, he then asked me to help him do a cleanse. And I said, I will. And then somehow I was mind wiped. Literally like a week later, he's like, did you get the herbs? I would be like, 
no, but I'm going to get him. And then it happened again. It happened like six times. By the six times, he was so angry with me. And I was laughing because I literally hadn't thought about it. So then I went and got him the herbs. He, took the, he did the cleanse and had a whole transformation. So um, at that point, when I was recording my record, uh, and I realized he had run a marathon, um, I realized that day, you know, I could really help this guy because I'm good in the kitchen, it's easy for me. So I just started creating plant-based food. So I ended up, I've created almost 400 plant-based recipes, published um, three cookbooks and, you know, Rich and I together on two, but he doesn't do any food, he doesn't cook anything. So it's all my food. And what I realized after I started developing this very basic cheese sort of collection was that it was really good. And I was really trying to get really clear on if I really wanted to do it. And after months of meditating- Versus other people wanting you to do it. Yeah, whether I wanted to do it, yeah. So after meditating for a long time, I was like, this cheese is just too, it's just too good for me not to do it. So then I started working with my friend, Brian O'Hara. I'm gonna show you the inside of the box. So my friend Brian O'Hara is a fine artist Stunning. and he uh, lives the world in reverse. So he reads and writes backwards. And so this says devotional offerings is what this is. And it creates a modern hieroglyph. So, and Brian's just, he's a master of logo. He's just, he's just such a gifted person. So Rich was like, you know, babe, you got to hurry up. Like, this is like, come on, like, hurry up. And I was like, just mm. give me my time. I took eight months developing the name and the logo. And, you know, and I didn't go out and research other cheese companies and see what they were doing and do a market research. And I just went inside my own chamber of my own heart and created an artful, beautiful offering of something that is so pure, that has such beautiful quality. It's seeped in spiritual devotion. I do fire ritual and uh, frequently. It's all infused with spiritual energy. Shrimu is fed to the fire. Our sacred makers, that's their title, they don't touch the cheese until they've breathed. So we have nature sounds in the kitchen and we are very community focused. So we mean it. It's not like, um, you know, it's, it's a mission. It's a global mission of awakening and it's about community. Community is the most important thing in Shrimu. So community with our subscribers and, uh, and the ingredients are pure. Uh, if I excel at anything, it's at uh, less is more. I think being an artist my whole life, when we're young artists, we overdo, overexpress, mm -hmm. too many elements, too many words in the song, too many. And I know the beauty is in the reduction, removing, 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 removing. So I also has a, have a very sensitive stomach. If I eat a handful of nuts, I'm going to have a stomach ache mm -hmm, immediately. Mm -hmm. Shrimu is cultured, soaked, pureed, blessed, handcrafted. I, in all the years that I've worked with it, now we've been in business almost three years, um, and uh, all the testing, which I was in testing for two years prior, mm -hmm. I've never had a stomach ache. I've never broken out. I've never felt like I gained weight. Um, it's just, we say it floats through your digestive tract like a prayer. That's so amazing. And I believe we have some that we're going to eat right now. So as with eating them, come on in. Thank you, my dear. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> this is so exciting. All right. So as we're going to eat this, guys, look, we've got a little spread right here. Where can people find Shrimu? Um, guys, honestly, it's hard to get you. You better bloody order it now because I know you guys sell out for the holidays and all of that. So where can people find it? We do. So um, we're direct to home delivery in the US and Canada. Um, so you can just go to Shrimu.com. On Instagram, we're at Shrimu Do Life. So it's S-R-I-M-U Do Life. Um, and we have, you know, many different boxes and varieties that you can choose from. Um, and you can subscribe either monthly, bi-monthly, or every three months. We also have one-time gift boxes as well and some crystal knives that go along with the orders. But um, yeah, um, there's many, 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 many varieties and ways you can order. And then we're also in Erwan markets. Mm. So we're the actual, actually we're the number one selling plant-based cheese in Erwan. 
Uh, yeah, that is amazing. Um, yeah, really good. And we're rolling out into wholesale. It's a different offering, so our subscribers always get the best. Um, but we are in wholesale in different varieties and different flavors. Um, so you can pick that up, you know, just specialty stores. Um, we're intentionally uh, opening um, different kinds of retail. I love that. Guys, honestly, you know my health issues. I'm not shy to talk about them. I have suffered from gut issues for so long now. And when you suffer from gut issues, it really does become an emotional thing because you have to sacrifice. You have to say no to foods that you really enjoy. You have to say no to hanging out with friends if they're having a meat and cheese tray because you can't eat it yourself. Mm -hmm. It can really affect you. And so this brand is why I feel so strongly about it and about you because... Mm -hmm. This actually, it becomes a thing where you don't feel left out. You now don't feel alone. You now feel like you can, um, you know, actually hang out with your friends and eat the same things. And that really does have an impact on my, it used to, on my self-esteem. Definitely. So I want to thank you for creating Aww. this product. Guys, literally, it's like I'm eating cheese. It's like I'm eating cheese. So you've got to go over right now. Check out the brand. Thank you so much, girl, for thank joining you, us. Lisa. Honestly, guys, if you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Bilyeu. And if you like this episode, please, please do subscribe. Tell your homies about it. Tell your homies about Shreemru. And then do make sure that you subscribe, like, comment. Let us know what the most powerful thing that she said today. I want to hear from you right now. And until <laughs> next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace. <laughs> and now I'm going to eat my cheese. Cheers. Cheers, girl. <laughs> If you want to find out, guys, how Mel Robbins actually got through the hardest part of her long-term relationship, then stay tuned because we're about to find out. Let's start by talking about what are the signs that you've noticed in a relationship where you have personally tried to say, hey, I've noticed you're crossing the line here. What is that sign and then how do you handle it? That is a great question. So you're talking about in my relationship with Chris? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, what's interesting about this as it relates to Chris is I feel like he probably has more instances where I am disrespecting him because I tend to be more, I'm just more of everything. I'm the whirlwind. I'm the one with ADHD. I'm the creative force. I'm the tornado through the house. And my husband is a very centered, very pulled back, very even kind of personality. And so I think there are lots of places where he has made requests that I do not follow through on. Okay, pause it. This is freaking amazing. <laughs> and here's the thing, I've heard you say that, in it where you were going through signs and then you're like, oh, I do that, oh, I do that. And that is beautiful. And the reason why it's beautiful is, it's not about necessarily just them, right? It's not about if someone's disrespecting you only, what do you do? It's right. the fact that are you being the dis disrespect into the relationship? Yes. And are they forgiving you because they want to see good in you? And so when we talk about how to have a successful relationship, you've been with your husband for so long, I've been with my husband for so long, and it's the nuances of it's not just them, it is you as well. Oh, it's 100% you. So, so here's the thing about somebody else disrespecting you. You know when it happens because your energy shifts in response to what they did. So I'm going to give you an exam, two examples where I'm the chief offender, okay? Actually, I can now think of like four or five. So <laughs> let's go deep, go. <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't help that I am married to a man who you know uh, well, who is a Buddhist meditation instructor. He's a certified yoga instructor. And today was day one at the age of 53 of him beginning to get his master's degree in something called, I think it's called transformational psychology, which is all about spiritual psychology and therapy. So the guy is so introspective that he is calm. He is like the opposite mm -hmm. energy of me and it has really worked. But there are times where I create major disorder, Lisa. And I would imagine knowing you and Tom and knowing how Tom is just so and the genius of his brain and knowing how you are, <laughs> that you probably have some of the same things. So here's an example. Cardboard boxes. I hate breaking down cardboard boxes. And we live in the age of Amazon. And so there are always cardboard boxes being delivered. 
and I will unpack cardboard boxes and then I neatly stack them by the door with the intention that at some point I will come back and cut them apart and flatten them out. I never do it. Like I literally never do it. I will carry them out to the garbage. They make it all the way to the garage, stacked like a Jenga puzzle, but I don't take it across. This drives Chris fucking crazy. Okay, that's one. And because he has asked me a thousand times to do it, I should do it. Because what he has said to me, Lisa, is when you don't do this, it makes me feel like I'm the maid or the custodian in our relationship. Another example is that I, this is an embarrassing thing to admit. Like now I'm coming on like confessions on Lisa's couch here. But I have really bad ADHD. And one of the things that I'm embarrassed to tell you. <laughs> Go on. Is that I blow my nose. And I will blow my nose, and the second I'm done blowing my nose and I start walking toward the garbage can, I literally forget that the Kleenex is in my hand. And then and I will walk past the garbage can, and then all of a sudden I leave it somewhere. It drives Chris crazy. And so the thing that I think is really important is that Chris keeps bringing it up. Mm -hmm. I've gotten way better at the cardboard box situation. He now understands that I don't want to do it just then. He likes to do it just then, but I don't like to do it just then because I'm thinking, what if I have to return this thing and I need this box? Mm -hmm. So I need, like, Lisa's literally zoning out already. She's like, Mel, you're fucking nuts. No, I'm like, I get his point. <laughs> right? I'm the one that wants you to cut the boxes, and Tom's the one that's like, why on earth would I spend even a second of my time cutting the box? Yes, completely. Now, the reason why I think this is so important is we're joking, right? It's like, oh, it's a cardboard box. And like, oh, but this is everything. Exactly. Because this is the moment, or these are the moments that we all know. And I think to your point is, you do that long enough, Mel, he's going to start to build resentment. Of course. You know, and I think here's the other thing. It's very easy when somebody speaks to you in a demeaning way mm. to call that out as disrespect. It's very easy when somebody uh, is verbally abusive to call or gives you the silent treatment to call that out as disrespect. But these small sort of injustices or these small sort of mm -hmm. passive aggressive things that create friction inside of you, this creates this distance emotionally between the two of you. Mm -hmm. And you are exactly right. It's inside these small things that all the resentment build. And it's also inside of these moments that you start to become sequestered emotionally from one another. And so, you know, those are two examples where in our relationship, there was on Chris's side, this deep feeling of being disrespected. On my side, the issue that kept coming up in our marriage, and this is even something that we've been talking to our marriage therapist about recently, which is, we have um, an incredible relationship, but one of the things that really hasn't been working and we didn't realize it is that my addiction to being busy, which is something that I have been doing a lot of work on, makes me be 15 steps ahead of Chris. And if you're with somebody for 26 years who is always 15 steps ahead, oh, I already booked the plane tickets. Oh, I already got a reservation. Oh, it's, a, it's all handled. Basically, what happens is my over-functioning and busyness has trained my husband to basically go, why bother, because either Mel's already handled it, or if I try to do it, she'll, it won't be the right thing. Mm. And so Chris withdraws into his corner, right? While I'm like out over here running 15 steps ahead. Now, while I'm out over here running 15 steps ahead, I'm going, why is nobody planning anything for my birthday? Why, you know, am I the one that's always doing this? Why is this? And Chris over here going, I don't have this, like, she's not letting me contribute. And this has been something that has become this well-worn thing between us for 26 years. 
really the, the thing I wanted to get to in this episode very specifically with you is there are signs of other people maybe mistreating us. So there's a lot of women that watch this show where they're stuck in relationships that they may not even be able to identify as toxic. And so where are those signs of the toxicity where maybe someone's manipulating you, gaslighting you, stonewalling you? But the second part to it is, this is what I feel about true freaking female empowerment, homie, is you've got to own your own shit. Yeah. And so while I sit here and I really want to talk about what are these signs that someone else may be showing us, I absolutely want to talk about, well, how are you showing up? Because I'm, I don't want to be that like, oh, well, it's them. Oh, it's them. No, no. Relationship is freaking 50-50. If you believe it's 50-50, how the hell are you showing up? Yeah. And if you think you're showing up, oh, I'm amazing and I'm the... Are you really? Are you actually giving your partner what they need? And so that was where I wanted to go. How do you know the way they're behaving is based on who they are or the way they're behaving is based on how you're responding to them? I think it's both. So, so it's an excellent question. And so here's what I want to say about it. If you want to know how you are showing up and if you want to truly improve how you participate in that relationship, simply send your partner a text that says, how can I be a better partner to you? And then ask for specifics. And Chris would tell me, well, you could flatten the cardboard boxes. You could throw out your Kleenex. You could put your phone down at six o'clock at night. You could, um, uh, you could take the dog for a walk in the morning. You could be more present. You could, like, he, he would have a whole list of things that would make a difference. And most of us don't bother to ask. So that's number one. You're not even asking. And when you ask that question, your job is to listen and elicit more things for you to do. It is not to defend yourself or to give feedback. And so that's number one. Number two, let's just go generally to disrespect. Because I answered the question by saying, you actually don't need a list of all those things because you know in your body when something's not right. If somebody's gaslighting you and they're making you feel like you're the one going nuts because they're like, I didn't say that. And you're like, well, yeah, you did. You feel friction in your body. You start questioning something. That is not your natural state. If the relationship works, whether it's a friendship or a romantic relationship, you will feel energetically aligned with the person. We, we, we are energetic human beings. The second that you are around a stranger or a friend or a parent or a sibling or uh, a lover and something feels off or you feel any kind of bad vibration, there is all the evidence that you need. I'm going to throw something at you then. Because yep. in that situation, I agree, but sometimes so many of us have taught ourselves to ignore it, taught ourselves to dull that feeling, because maybe from childhood we've been We taught, didn't teach ourselves. We were taught to. We were taught to. So over time, we carry that with us. And so mm -hmm. so many of you are 100% right. If you can acknowledge, oh, this is uncomfortable. But I think so many of us in those moments start by going, oh my God, what did I do wrong? I must be going crazy. You even said it, right? So how do we break that notion of us going straight to, oh my God, it must be me. I must be going crazy. Instead of saying, well, hang on a minute, sit with it. So um, I've been talking about this a lot lately. But I um, have spent the last two years really doing a ton of work on my own nervous system regulation mm -hmm. and on trying to heal anxiety from the neck down in my body. And so I want to say that, yes, we were all, especially as little girls, our generation, and I'm a little bit older than you, but our generation grew up with a parenting style and method of the time, which is to correct children to make them behave. It was not about connection. And for many of us, there was a complete mismatch with the way that our parents uh, communicated with us and what we actually needed. And so a lot of us were taught in childhood that love is transactional, 
that I love you when you're behaving. I am proud of you when you get good grades. I survived that. It's no big deal. And so there were moments where the big word is separate. You felt separate from the person, your mother or your father, who you needed to feel attached to in order to be safe. Mm. And when you have an experience of feeling separate, an alarm goes off. And it could be literally something as benign as you fall and instead of getting a hug, you're lifted up and told to get back out there. It doesn't hurt. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. It could be as simple as you really wanted to play the flute, but your parents were like, nope, everybody in the family plays the trumpet, here you go. This moment of feeling separate, and it makes you feel unsafe. And what you get trained in is you get trained to feel like somebody's happiness and keeping everybody okay is your job. And you like all guilt comes from one place, which is we feel guilty because we think we're responsible for somebody else being happy. That's where it all comes from. Because children can't go, oh, mom's having a bad day. That's why she's being a bitch right now. Children go, oh, I feel separate from her and she's angry and so something must be wrong with me. That's the source of all anxiety. It's the source of all alarm. It's this feeling of being separate and unsafe because you're not getting what you need. And so how this relates to toxic behavior is we are so used to making excuses for everybody else. We are so used to feeling like somebody else's okayness is more important than ours. We are so used to thinking that being liked and being loved means managing people's disappointment because a lot of love from the parenting style of our parents' generation is transactional. It's about correcting us. It's about, uh, you know, our, that generation was not even taught about our emotional needs. It's not their fault. They didn't get it either. And so I feel like step number one is you got to understand that whenever you have that like first wave, so let's just take something really simple. Your sister, who you love, mm -hmm. when you're little, would come in and borrow your shit and not tell you. And your mom, if you got upset, would be like, just let it go. Mm. Right? Yeah. And so I don't know that that happened in your house, but we have- It was probably more the other way around. I think I was stealing her shit, but- <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, as the mother of two daughters, I saw this all the time. And so, you know, I, if you're not validated in that situation, you start to feel Ooh. like you don't matter. And so what happens is if you're an adult and your spouse does not like slice the cardboard boxes, it actually brings up that shit from childhood that got stored in your body. That experience of being separate, that experience of being uh, not seen, not important, not loved. And so the first alarm that goes off is the alarm from the little you that didn't get the reassurance or love in that experience from childhood. And it's always triggered by moments of separateness. So in your romantic relationship, like I, you know, I'm even processing this live with you right now. When I put the Kleenex on the uh, countertop and not in the garbage can underneath because of my ADHD, I literally like just have a brain like, Whoa! forgot about it. I didn't even, I didn't even remember it was in my hand. Mm. When Chris sees it, he has the same experience from childhood of nobody being home when he got home from school. He doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if he asks because they have an excuse. That is what that brings up in his body. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. And so the first thing that you need to do is to understand that that discomfort in your body Let's not call it anxiety anymore. Let's just call it, it's the little you. And you need to give yourself a little bit of love and reassurance just right in that moment. Because you didn't get it as a child and your body keeps triggering it in moments of separation or moments where you feel invisible because you remember feeling that way as a kid. We all have this. Everybody has this. Then you just, you can put your hand on your heart. You can take a deep breath. You can just like, be like, whatever, like whatever you need to do to go toward this thing, instead of going, something's wrong and kill my spouse, like there's such a jerk, 
just be like, oh, whoa, there I go. I feel a little like there it is. That's that little me feeling invisible, feeling like I don't matter. I do matter. And, you know, what Chris does now, which is super helpful, is he takes a photo of it. He doesn't touch it. He takes a photo of it. And then I always just apologize. You're, oh my God, I don't even remember doing that. I am so sorry. Thank you for leaving it for me so I can take care of it. And thank you for not throwing it out because I didn't leave it there for you. Mm -hmm. I'm trying, you know, and I appreciate your patience. So that closes the loop, but you will never express the boundary that you need to express until you also address the alarm that keeps going off because you're not even giving yourself the basics of what you need. So there's no way in hell you are going to express what you need to another person. No way. And so all boundaries, they don't start with like, and I don't even like saying like a toxic person. I like saying toxic behavior because then mm. it puts it on you. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not a toxic person, but I engage in toxic behavior. It's powerful. Right? And here's why I like calling it toxic behavior versus a toxic person. We are in too much of a cancel culture. Mm -hmm. We ghost people, we label people and toss them to the side. And I believe that every human being is capable of changing. And I also believe that if you want people to become better, whether that's better in terms of their mental health or better in terms of their habits or addictions or beliefs or whatever it may be, you have to fucking create room for people to change. And by labeling somebody as toxic and then just tossing them out the window, you are not identifying the behavior that doesn't work for you. And when you start to go, the behavior of, si of you giving me the silent treatment is toxic behavior. And this is what my boundary is with it. Now, look, I realize your comments are not going to blow up with people who have been in relationships with narcissists. And, you know, that you <laughs> they are toxic. Maybe their behavior is toxic, but isn't it also toxic for you to gossip to your girlfriends and not do anything about it? Isn't it also toxic for you to beat yourself up in your head and, and like not leave a situation like that? And by the way, don't you dare sit here and accuse me of saying anybody deserves anything. What I'm trying to say, because nobody deserves to be abused. What I'm trying to say is it's real easy to point the finger but the power is in looking in the mirror and taking responsibility for what you're going to do. And having been a, you know, I, I worked a domestic violence hotline as a crisis intervention counselor for four years. And so there is the psychological entrapment. There are very real reasons why people stay in abusive relationships. That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about your garden variety bullshit that happens in a lot of relationships. Being passive aggressive, not asking for what you need, not pointing out what somebody is doing wrong, but gossiping about them instead. Uh, tolerating the same crap over and over and over again and never saying anything, which is like the reverse form of the silent treatment because nobody is going to get better if you don't tell them what they're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that I also do that's toxic is for the last two years, um, uh, we have been in the middle of renovating a house in Southern Vermont. Our son is going to the public high school up there. And so my husband, Chris and I have literally been back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between our house that we have lived in for 26 years outside of Boston while we're renovating this place in Southern Vermont. And it's a three hour drive. And while we were under renovations, I couldn't be filming videos there or doing virtual speeches there, I had to be in Boston. And so I would go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it was exhausting. But here's my toxic behavior. Whenever Chris would go, well, why don't I come down? Oh, no, it's okay. You don't need to make the drive. I'll be up on Friday. And so my other toxic behavior in this relationship is literally not letting him help me. 
and then being burnt out and pissed off that you never come see me. <laughs> right? Yeah, and then building, yep, building that resentment as well, but it's yes. actually not true. It's, it's a not true story that you're telling yourself. Yes, because my toxic behavior is I just got to take care of myself. Like I'm not used to somebody else taking care of me. So I, you know, it's just what it's like as a little girl. I take care of everybody's emotions and you're like, I, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so I think, you know, a couple things that we've covered so far. Number one, all you need to know about toxic behavior and, you know, that sort of disrespect is that you will feel tension or you will feel some sort of something in your body, friction in your body. There's your sign. Second thing that you've learned is that a lot of times that alarm that's going off when you're either experiencing disrespect or you're disrespecting yourself, that is a stored memory in your body from being a little kid and feeling separate or invisible. So step number two after recognizing it is give yourself a little love, give yourself a hug. There's a super cool technique that Dr. Russell does where you like take a towel and you like, you know, kind of pull a towel like this around you like, Oh, like giving to, like, yourself, give yourself a, a hug, hug. Yeah. but you do it actually not like this, but with a towel. Huh. It's really cool. Mm. And then the third thing is once you've sort of turned off the alarm, now ask yourself, what is the request you need to make? What is it about the thing that the person said or the thing that they did that is triggering this in you? And the thing about giving another human being feedback is I think it's really important to make sure you understand how to explain the impact that their behavior is having on you. Because if you just go to somebody and say, can you please just do the freaking cardboard boxes? Or Chris would get really mm -hmm. upset with me and be like, you know, they can't pick up the cardboard boxes unless they're cut up. And so now I'm being made wrong. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to, of course, it's human instinct to defend yourself when you're made wrong. But when Chris comes to me and says, you know, if the boxes sit for more than 24 hours, I know you're not coming back to get them. And that means that you believe I'm going to do it for you. That makes me feel like I'm your hired helper. What I'm asking is I'm okay with you leaving the boxes stacked like a puzzle for 24 hours because I know you might need one of them to ship something back. But either set an alarm on your phone and slice them down or come to me and ask me if I can do it for you. Hmm. So in addition to telling what's the behavior, why, how does it make you feel and why, and the third piece is, this is what I need you to do. Because you know what you need the person to do. You know what's not working. You know why it's causing friction. And that is all you need to do in your relationship. And so now you've taken care of this alarm that goes off that comes from childhood that makes you feel separate or invisible or unlovable or unloved. You have soothed yourself which means you're now giving yourself what you need. And now you're empowered to ask somebody else by saying, this is the behavior. This is why, how it makes me feel. Because when Chris tells me that's how it makes him feel, I feel like a fucking asshole because I love the guy. I don't want him to feel like that because that's not what I mean. And so when I know the emotional connection to executing this task, I am 10 times more likely to do it. Because a cardboard box stacked by a door does not mean anything to me. All right, guys, if you enjoyed that episode, click here and watch Matthew Hussey share the red flags that he's just wasting your freaking time and he's not right for you. You don't trust that someone's never going to betray you. You just trust that you'll be able to handle it if they do, that you'll be able to walk away.